This presentation provides a brief summary of the redfish fishery, its current status, and outlines some topics we are seeking public feedback on. So why are we here? Redfish is one of Florida's most iconic and popular recreational fisheries, consistently in the top three for both coasts. This year, we published the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute's updated stock assessment for redfish. The assessment found the fishery is meeting the commission's management goal in most of the state. However, over the past few years, staff has heard a variety of concerns about this fishery. We have also received requests for management changes to address those concerns. Given the difference between what we have heard from the public and the results from the updated assessments, staff would like to get additional feedback to better understand angler experiences and concerns with the fishery. We'd also like to understand what management changes you would like to see and why. We know anglers highly value redfish for sport and the dinner plate. Due to its long-standing importance to Floridians, redfish management dates back nearly 140 years. In the 1980s, redfish was severely overfished, so the Marine Fisheries Commission, which was the predecessor agency to FWC, implemented a series of emergency fishery closures to prevent stock collapse. They also developed a set of long-term regulations to help rebuild the population. These efforts worked, and redfish management is considered a great success story. Much of the current management approach was implemented in 1989, when the Commission was addressing a collapsing fishery. While the approach hasn't really changed, there have been some regulation changes. This slide shows the current regulations in our management regions. I'll point out that commercial harvest is prohibited in state waters, and in federal waters there is no harvest of redfish allowed at all. Right now, the recreational bag limit is the only regulation in rule that is not the same statewide. There is, however, an additional temporary catch and release measure for redfish in place for portions of Southwest Florida, which I'll go into next. You are likely aware that temporary regulations in response to the prolonged severe 2017 to 2019 red tide have been in place in one form or another in Southwest Florida since 2018. The current executive order that addresses the 2017 to 2019 event covers Sarasota Bay through Gordon Pass in Collier County. In this area, shown in blue on the map, redfish and snook are temporarily catch and release only. For sea trout, there is a temporary vessel limit in place. This executive order is effective through May 31, 2022. We just talked about some short-term management responses. Now let's focus on the long-term management approach and management goal, which really drives how the Commission sets long-term regulations. The Commission's management approach has focused on angler values and satisfaction. Accordingly, the current management goal of 40% escapement for redfish provides for a sustainable fishery and is also intended to meet angler values and generate angler satisfaction. For redfish, escapement rate is the percent of fish surviving through age four and becoming mature, compared to what would happen if there was no fishing at all. Fish that reach age four are said to escape the fishery because they are larger than the slot limit and can no longer be harvested. Achieving the escapement goal maintains the stock well above the biological limit of 20% and enables the stock to be resilient to unexpected events. It also provides for a greater abundance and more large fish. The current management approach and goal have been in place for a number of years, but since Florida's population and coastal communities are ever-changing, the Commission could consider adopting additional or alternative metrics to support the agency's continued efforts to proactively and effectively manage redfish. Before moving on to a discussion about the recent assessment to see how the stock is performing compared to the management goal, I'd like to point out the difference between our management regions, which you saw on the current regulation slide, and the assessment regions. There are three management regions shown on the map on the left, the Northwest, South, and Northeast region. However, there are four assessment regions as shown on the map on the right. The Southern region is the main difference between the two. The southern portion of the state makes up a single management region, but the assessment splits that region up and assesses the southwest separately from the southeast. 
Now let's look at the recent stock assessment results from the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, which used data through 2019. Looking at the graph, you can see that all assessment regions are exceeding the 20% biological limit shown by the red limit line, and all regions except the southeast are exceeding the escapement goal shown as the green goal line. Estimated escapement in the southwest region is at 72%, which is well above the goal. This is expected since much of this region has been catch and release since late 2018, allowing more fish to grow to sizes greater than the slot limit. The northwest and northeast region are also exceeding the management goal at 48% and 61% respectively. However, as I mentioned, the southeast region is the only region not meeting the goal and is measured at 35%. Let's take a quick tour of the figures you'll see on the next several upcoming slides. These graphs show some of the data that goes into the stock assessment. On the left are indices of ab abundance developed from data collected by FWC's Fishery Independent Monitoring Program. Young of Year Abundance is on the top. This data shows what we call recruitment, or how many new fish join the fishery each year. The bottom figure shows subadult abundance, which includes fish in the slot limit. The figure on the right shows recreational landings, which are based in part on information provided by fishermen like yourself. Now the graphs on this slide spe are specifically for the Northwest region. As you can see from the young of year abundance trends, the data over time is variable, which is not uncommon, with no obvious trends. And subadult abundance has remained fairly constant over time. And as shown on the right, recreational landings were high in the early 1980s before the fishery became overfished. Then in 1988, you can see how the emergency closures curbed landings. Since then, recreational landings slowly increased and recently have been relatively consistent. Now for the Southwest region. As shown on the top left, young a year abundance is again highly variable and there are no obvious trends. And subadult abundance has remained relatively constant over time. Similarly, for recreational landings data, you can see landings were high in the early 1980s before the fishery became overfished. And then in 1988, you can see how the emergency closures curbed landings. Since then, recreational landings remained relatively consistent. However, recently they have decreased, but this is not unexpected due to the catch and release measures in a large portion of this region from 2018 to present. For the Northeast region, the young of year abundance is highly variable, but index has been low since 2014. As for subadult abundance, this index has remained relatively constant until about 2012, and then in 2013, we start to see a general declining trend. Similar to the two previous regions, recreational landings in the early 1980s before the fishery became overfished were high. Then in 1988, you can see how the emergency closures curbed landings. Since then, recreational landings increased somewhat, but were variable until 2010. Then after the regional bag limit was raised to two fish in 2011, recreational landings noticeably increased. Even with the recent lower abundance indices in the Northeast region, overall the assessment found the average escapement rate from 2017 to 2019 to be 61%, which is exceeding the management target. Although the assessment was positive for all of the regions talked about so far, the Northwest, Southwest, and Northeast region, we acknowledge that it is a retrospective look that examines the fishery on a fairly large geographic scale. Stock assessments do not tell what may be occurring on a very localized scale, where things like water quality, habitat loss, and harmful algal blooms can affect the local fishing experience. As for the Southeast region, the only region not currently meeting the 40% goal, young of year abundance has varied annually, but there has been an overall downward trend since 2005, indicating a decrease in recruitment of new fish into the population. There has also been a decline in subadult abundance since 2017, and the index since then has been at an all-time low, the lowest level in the time series. On the right, recreational landings have also shown a decline since 2016. 
Staff attributes the inability to meet the management goal for redfish in the southeast to problems within the Indian River Lagoon, also referred to as the IRL. The system has experienced over a decade of poor water quality and habitat loss that is affecting fisheries and other wildlife. A 2010 cold snap caused a large fish kill that was followed by reoccurring harmful algal blooms over the next decade, which contributed to a significant seagrass loss. Since 1992, the IRL has lost over half of its seagrass and essentially no large seagrass beds remain. The effect of these environmental problems on fisheries is documented in our fisheries independent monitoring data, which shows species composition shift in the northern IRL from seagrass dependent species like sea trout, pinfish, and redfish to muddy sandy bottom species like black drum, sheep's head, and catfish. Because the stock assessment results may not always align with public feedback, which is the case for redfish, FWC is gathering stakeholder input to help inform the Commission's management of the fishery. Work that has already been done is shown on the screen, and more is to come, in the form of workshops and small group meetings. First was an angler satisfaction survey to gather feedback and inform planning of the Summer's Redfish Summit. We emailed the survey to guides and a randomized sample of recreational license holders. We heard back from nearly 3,000 people. Our inaugural Redfish Summit was a day-long event that drew in over 100 attendees, and it was broadcasted on the Florida Channel. A large portion of the summit was dedicated to breakout sessions for different geographic areas, where stakeholders provided feedback on the following. One, what issues they thought threatened the redfish fishery. Two, ideas for solutions to those issues. Three, desired regulation changes. And four, what if, if any, guide-specific regulations should be implemented. The Southwest Breakout Group was also asked to provide input on current catch and release measures. Through the survey, we learned the majority of respondents have not been satisfied with the redfish fishery over the last year, and they commonly responded that catching more redfish would increase satisfaction. Some attendees also voiced dissatisfaction with the fishery and reported not seeing as many redfish as in the past. They also had concerns about increased fishing pressure. Both in the survey and at the summit, stakeholders identified poor water quality and habitat degradation as significant issues of concern for redfish. Some attendees in the Southwest breakout session provided mixed input on the catch and release measures, but the most common feedback was to extend catch and release for another year. Those who were less enthusiastic about the closure said they would support a closure if science indicated it was necessary. There was some disconnect between the top issues and the top solutions, because when asked for suggestions on how to address issues facing the fishery, the most popular responses were increased data collection, additional law enforcement, outreach and education, and increased stocking. Feedback on desired regulatory changes included a wide range of requests. The most common were reducing the bag and vessel limit, implementing seasonal closures, prohibiting captain and crew from keeping a personal limit when on a for hire trip, requiring catch and release in the IRL in Southwest Florida, and modifying license requirements and cost. Additionally, some attendees asked the agency to use a more holistic approach towards redfish management, incorporating habitat, environmental impacts like harmful algal blooms, and water quality into the redfish management approach. We talked with our commission about the public's interest in changing the way FWC approaches management of redfish at their recent commission meeting. We talked about how the public has requested FWC approach redfish management more holistically. This would include being more explicit about incorporating environmental conditions and other information into management decisions. For example, the commission could consider including additional metrics in addition to escapement into the current management approach, such as habitat availability and quality, frequency and intensity of harmful algal blooms, water quality, increasing coastal populations and numbers of anglers, and information provided by anglers and guides. Taking a new approach for redfish beyond a single management goal could facilitate the intentional incorporation of additional metrics to guide management decisions for the fishery. 
We received a lot of great feedback from the Angler Satisfaction Survey and the Redfish Summit, but we want to know what you think too. This is why we are now holding workshops throughout the state to see if other anglers have the same concerns, ideas, and opinions as what we have already heard. The stars on the map indicate where we will be holding workshops. There will also be a virtual workshop that is open to everyone. Additionally, we'd like to explore changing FWC's redfish management approach, and we want your input on this too. FWC has historically managed redfish for not only sustainability, but also for angler satisfaction. We've relied on escapement as our management goal to benchmark how the fishery is meeting our approach. FWC could adopt a new management approach or additional management metrics. We could also modify the management regions, which would provide additional flexibility in addressing regional concerns and issues. First, we'd like to know how you think the redfish fishery is doing and whether you have any concerns about the fishery. We'd also like your input on regulations and if you think they need to be updated, and if so, how. For example, should the bag and vessel limit be changed? Should captain and crew be prohibited from retaining a personal bag limit when on a for hire trip? Should we establish a seasonal closure for redfish? If so, when would you recommend? Should redfish be made catch and release? Or maybe you have any additional ideas. More importantly, we'd like to know why you want those regulations changed. The other grouping of questions we'd like you to respond to is related to FWC's management approach for the fishery. Does it need to be changed? Should we modify the management regions to provide for additional flexibility in addressing regional issues and concerns? If so, what should those new management regions look like? Would you be okay if those regulations in one region differed from another? If FWC adopts a new management approach, should additional metrics guide management in addition to 40% escapement? A list of potential metrics is on the screen, but maybe you like to provide others. There are multiple ways to provide feedback. You could attend an in-person and or virtual workshop, submit comments at myfwc.com slash saltwatercomments, contact us directly about organizing a small group meeting, and attend a commission meeting. Staff plans to present the public feedback gathered and a proposal for a new management approach tentatively at the December 2021 commission meeting. Thank you so much for tuning in.